When Botticelli died in 1510, at the age of 65, he had already been eclipsed by Leonardo and Michelangelo. He was then more thoroughly forgotten than any other major European painter for nearly 400 years. How then did his work become so iconic and widely reproduced that Andy Warhol would elevate it to the ironic heaven of pop art? The resurrection of Botticelli and the apotheosis of his Venus began with Walter Pater's 1870 Botticelli essay, included in his 1873 book, The Renaissance. This became nearly a manifesto for the Pre-Raphaelite movement, an English school of painting which exalted the artists of the early Italian Renaissance. As a result of Pater and the Pre-Raphaelites, appreciation of such forgotten masters as Botticelli became integral to what the English called the aesthetic movement and which was known as symbolism in France. Botticelli's adoption by these last major pre-modern movements in art led to him being, from 1900 to 1920, the most written-about painter on earth. Thus, when color printing first came into general use, Botticelli would be a natural candidate and enduring favorite for art books, postcards, and by the late 20th century, posters and refrigerator magnets. To understand Botticelli's career, it is worth our while to consider two paragraphs from Pater's essay, in which he nearly discovers the secret of Botticelli's women, and then re-obscures it with a late romantic gynophobia. It is this which gives to his Madonnas their unique expression and charm. He has worked out in them a distinct and peculiar type, definite enough in his own mind, for he has painted it over and over again, sometimes one might think almost mechanically, as a pastime during that dark period when his thoughts were so heavy upon him. Hardly any collection of note is without one of these circular pictures, into which the attendant angels depress their heads so naively. Perhaps you have sometimes wondered why those peevish-looking Madonnas, conformed to no acknowledged or obvious type of beauty, attract you more and more, and often come back to you when the Sistine Madonna and the versions of Fra Angelico are forgotten. At first, contrasting them with those, You may have thought that there was something in the mean or abject even, for the abstract lines of the face have little nobleness, and the color is wan. For with Botticelli, she too, though she holds in her hands the desire of all nations, is one of those who are neither for Jehovah nor for his enemies, and her choice is on her face. The white light on it is cast up hard and cheerless from below as when snow lies on the ground and the children look up with surprise at the strange whiteness of the ceiling. Her trouble is in the very caress of the mysterious child whose gaze is always far from her and who has already that sweet look of devotion which men have never been able altogether to love and which makes the born saint an object almost of suspicion to his earthly brethren. Once, indeed, he guides her hand to transcribe in a book the words of her exaltation, the Ave, and the Magnificat, and the Gauda Maria, and the young angels, glad to rouse her for a moment from her dejection, are eager to hold the inkhorn and to support the book. But the pen almost drops from her hand, and the high, cold words have no meaning for her, and her true children are those others among whom, in her rude home, the intolerable honor came to her, with that look of wistful inquiry on their irregular faces which you see in startled animals, 
gypsy children, such as those who in Apennine villages still hold out their long brown arms to beg of you, but on Sunday become enfants du coeur, with their thick black hair nicely combed and fair white linen on their sunburnt throats. What is strangest is that he carries this sentiment into classical subjects, its most complete expression being a picture in the Uffizi of Venus rising from the sea, in which the grotesque emblems of the Middle Age and a landscape full of its peculiar feeling and even its strange draperies powdered all over in the Gothic manner with a quaint conceit of daisies, frame a picture that reminds you of the faultless nude studies of Angre. At first, perhaps, you are attracted only by a quaintness of design, which seems to recall all at once whatever you have read of Florence in the fifteenth century. Afterwards, you may think that this quaintness must be incongruous with the subject, and that the color is cadaverous, or at least cold. The light is indeed cold, mere sunless dawn, but a later painter would have cloyed you with sunshine, and you can see the better for that quietness in the morning air each long promontory as it slopes down to the water's edge. Men go forth to their labors until the evening, but she is awake before them, and you might think that the sorrow in her face was at the thought of the whole long day of love yet to come. An emblematical figure of the wind blows hard across the gray water, moving forward the dainty-lipped shell on which she sails, the sea showing his teeth as it moves, in thin lines of foam and sucking in, one by one, the falling roses, each severe in outline, plucked off short at the stalk, but embrowned a little, as Botticelli's flowers always are. I have used the much-abused term gynophobia to describe Pater's agenda, and I employ it precisely. Pater has projected his own romantic anxieties, his fears of rejection and love withheld or denied, upon these images. The Madonnas, Pater tells us, are peevish. They have something mean or abject about them. They lack nobleness which is a roundabout way of saying they are beautiful women as much as they are religious images. He says, The Madonna's faces shine with a hard and cheerless light, neither of God nor of the devil, but of total self-absorption. They are indifferent to the children in their arms, who are emotionally orphaned, neglected, vagabond, gypsy children, wistful, pathetic seekers of unattainable love. Peter's treatment of Venus is even more direct. She is pale and cold as a cadaver, an emblem of the sadness of pleasure, that is to say, of regret for sexual feelings. The Victorian condemnation of sensuality here becomes even more direct. She and her shell are a cruel apotheosis, white gleams of the ocean showing its teeth. All this neurosis struck fin de siècle readers as compelling because it brought Botticelli into the late romantic mythology of the fatal woman. It must be recalled that Van Sacher Massoch's novels, with their heroines, in his phrase, cruelly beautiful and beautifully cruel, were international bestsellers in Pater's time, and regarded not as specialty porn, but as serious modern literature. Thus, in two longish paragraphs of overripe prose, Walter Pater repackaged Botticelli's women as high-class masochistic fantasy, and thus made his Venus a cultural icon in the dawn of the 20th century. To really understand women, even women in paintings, women are more insightful informants than men. The great early 20th century poet Anna Margolin who wrote successful fashion columns for Manhattan's Yiddish press, has left us in her poem Girls in Crotona Park a wonderfully telling, if somewhat feline, analysis of the Botticelli mystique. Un harpstick in Fahrnacht haben medlich sich verwebt wie in a welken Bild. Sere Eugen seinen Kill der Schmeichel wild und din 
Seine Kleider seien in Lavender, Altreus und Apfelgrün. In ihre Adern fließt Toi. Sie haben Werte hell und leere. Sie hat in Träum geliebt Botticelli. As a rule, living women find Botticelli girls annoying, and Margolin shows us why. Her merciless lyric makes inventory of their exquisite vapidity. These tall, slender supermodels of the Renaissance, with their long fingers and finger-like toes, exemplify the shallowness and attractiveness of popular girls in high school. Botticelli's women are reflections of a certain kind of male fantasy and a certain kind of female aspiration. Lovely, childlike, idea-free creatures with smooth brows and wide eyes alike indicative of not much thought. Young women for whom being beautiful absorbs all their mental energy or who are willing to act as though that were the case to seem agreeably non-threatening to men. No wonder Andy Warhol saw in this Venus a peer of Marilyn, whose film persona was precisely of this type. He chose to show only her face, like the close-up of the star on a movie screen, offering to the audience an impossibly colossal intimacy. Also, Warhol was probably happy to edit out of the frame the somewhat distended abdomens Botticelli favored, for the female ideal of the Renaissance was still very female and fertile. Botticelli's women present the edited perfection of the Barbie doll. Venus and Barbie are, in the context of 20th century culture, in many ways equivalent. Women who possess this kind of beauty easily produce frustrated reactions like Pater's fascinated disapproval and Margolin's fascinated contempt. Which brings us back to the Nostagio images. Here, in a singular and unpremeditated disclosure, Botticelli reveals the undercurrent of physical desire he was so successful in sublimating everywhere else. Repressed erotic energy turned inward and become cruel is the subtext of the Cavalier's desires. Boccaccio says, The Cavalier, having concluded his discourse, sword in hand, ran raging like a mad dog upon the maiden who, on her knees, held in place by the two mastiffs, cried loud for mercy. With all his strength he drove his brand through the center of her chest, so that it passed clear through and came out her back. After receiving this blow, she fell forward on her face, weeping and screaming still. The knight took a dagger, with which he opened her back near the kidneys, and dragging out her heart and all the internal organs, he threw them to the two hounds, who straightway devoured them as eagerly as if they'd been starving. The cavalier runs upon her like a mad dog. The identification of the knight himself with the dogs that accompany him as inseparable attributes is here explicit. The symbolic penetration, the oral sadism, the desire to punishingly absorb the love object so long denied, left subliminal in the story, here becomes, in the paintings, horrifically visible. We know that Botticelli, at the end of his life, became a follower of the ascetic fundamentalist Savonarola. He ended his days illustrating the Divine Comedy, without pay, and without color, except for hell, in what looks like a personal act of penance. Now we can better understand why. Not that Botticelli was in any way abnormal, but as a devout Catholic at the end of the Middle Ages, he was raised with a level of sexual repression that is barely imaginable in the early 21st century in the industrialized world. This gave him an ambivalence towards his normal desires. Repression produced his beautiful female figures with their hallucinatory, not quite erotic charm. Their expressions may seem detached, as they did to Pater, or shallow, as Margolin thought, but in reality they are neither cold nor stupid, but merely, as women, unreal. They are fantasies, though considering their astonishing beauty, 
it would be fairer to call them visions. The cost of this sublime sublimation was a demonization of Botticelli's normal drives, which made them seem to him as ugly and frightening as they appear in the Nostagio images. So ugly, in fact, that Botticelli felt he had to atone for them in the last decades of his life by illustrating Dante. Now, when we look at the Paradiso illustrations, we may see Botticelli in the person of Dante, united at last with his female ideal, in a world where the physical has been entirely overcome, and the weightless, colorless soul, emptied of every trace of physical being and physical desire, rises in love into a heaven of abstract purity. Thank you.